Well, church, we are in uh, getting close to the end of this current series called uh, "The King Is Here." And today, I really, I really just want to continue to talk about not just who Jesus is, not just what He said, but today we want to talk about what Jesus did when He showed up. What did He do, and what does that mean for us as followers? Uh, of Jesus Christ, how does that impact our lives today? Uh, and today, I want to start with with some things. I just want to try to get a gauge of where you are. So, uh, I'm, I'm gonna put a few graphics on, on the screen here, and I want to see if you could tell me uh, uh, what these graphics are. What these graphics are. Let's put this first one up there, Rob. You put that first one. What's that right there? It's a stoplight. Did somebody say it was a stoplight? I heard somebody say a stoplight. I said no, not quite. Yeah, it's a stop. What sign? Y'all got it. All right. Let's see the next one. Let's see the next one. All right, what's that? No, that's a, that's a man and a woman. No, it is a restroom sign. I was just messing with you to see if you're going to pay attention. That's a sign to tell us what? That this is a restroom or this is a restroom is near or whatever it is. Let's, let's go to the next sign. Let's see what we got here. What's that for? It's a suggestion. Absolutely. <laughs> Unless you're driving through my neighborhood, then you should be doing 20 miles an hour. Who goes 20 miles an hour? It's a what? It's a sign. Here's, here's my, my last one. It's one of my favorite ones. Let's go. It's the last one up there for me. Free Wi-Fi. Oh, man. Praise God. Anybody else thankful when you go somewhere? It's like, oh, the Wi-Fi? Is, thank you. I'm glad someone else was honest with me. Uh, this free Wi-Fi sign. Here it is. That while we see these signs, guess what we don't do? We don't celebrate signs. We know these signs, but we don't what? Celebrate them. These signs actually do something for us. They actually uh, uh, inform us. They direct us. And sometimes these signs warn us. That, that signs do primarily those three things. They inform us. They direct us. Or they warn us. And today, I want to talk about the signs we see through the work of Jesus' life. We see him perform uh, many signs. And one of the things I think that we, we, we struggle with as Christians is that sometimes we celebrate the signs and not Jesus. These signs are all good signs. These are signs that we need to pay attention to. They direct us. They grab our attention. But we don't celebrate the signs. The signs are not the most important thing. Actually, signs actually reveal something else. And it's the same way with Jesus. His signs, listen to me, church, was not the goal. The things that he did, the work in his ministry, while those things were very important, they actually pointed to something else. And today I want to make sure as we talk about Jesus Christ and his time on earth and the work that he did and the miracles and the signs and the wonders that he performed, that we don't get caught up in the signs, but we get caught up in the person. Are you hearing me? So here, a main idea today, I want you to write this down if you can, is that what Jesus did reveals more than what he can do for us, but who he should be to us. Because most of the time, we find people that are looking for signs from God. We're looking for the hand of God to work in our life, and we're only looking at God for what he can do for us. But I would like to suggest today that those signs really are called to reveal who he should be to us, not just what he can do for us. Are y'all with me? So, so let's go to John, John chapter number 6, verse 14. Because I believe in John chapter number 6, number 14, verse 14, and actually in this entire story of John chapter number 6, we'll find out why it's so important for us not to just look for the sign. The sign is important, but we got to make sure that it's revealing something to us about who God should be to us. So, John chapter number 6, verse 14, and we're just going to stop here. It's going to be kind of the, the foundation of our sermon time today. It says this, when the people did what? When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Is that what your Bible says? You just trust in the screen. Get your Bible? It says this, when the people saw the sign, that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. I want you to highlight this, this verse in your Bible if you have, have the ability to do so. Today I want to preach a sermon topic, don't miss the sign. Don't, don't miss 
the sign. Don't miss the sign. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Some of you who uh, are already familiar with this verse, maybe you're familiar with the, the whole chapter of John chapter number 6. This actually reveals the story that many of us call uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000. How many of y'all have ever heard of Jesus feeding the 5,000? And this particular miracle that Jesus performs uh, is set in a context where he has many people that are following after him. And uh, Mark's account of this gospel says that Jesus was concerned for the people. He saw that they were hungry. They had followed him for, for many, many miles now. And he, he begins to feed them. The problem is, is that, of course, they have no money. They have no food. The truth is they were in a desolate place. And the Bible says that there was a small boy there who has what? Two fish and what? Five loaves of bread. Y'all went to Sunday school. That's all right. Two fish and five loaves of bread. And the Bible says that they gave this, these two fish and these five loaves of bread to Jesus. And the Bible says that he blessed those things. He broke it and he gave it to the disciples. And he tells all 5,000 of people, which actually was somewhere between the numbers of 15 and 20,000 because that included uh, uh, women and children. And here it is. He breaks all of this up and he gives it to the disciples. He says, listen, sit them down in groups of 50. And he feeds all 15 to 20,000 people with two fish and five barley loaves of bread. So much so blessed and multiplied, this miracle happened, that after this, that Jesus tells the disciples to gather what's left, and there was 12 baskets full uh, of overflow of, of two fish and five barley loaves. And in this text, we find what I think is really the most important part of this entire story is the response to what he did. Because most times when we look at this story, and I've preached this sermon this way, that we look at what God can do for us. We serve a God that can multiply. We serve a God that will provide for us. And that is true, but that is not the point of the miracle. Today I want to give some, some context to this because I believe sometimes we're coming to Jesus for what he can do for us and not what he should be to us. Yeah, yeah, what can he do for me? Not what he has done uh, for me and to me. Here it is that in this text, there was a bigger story, listen to me church, than just meeting the needs of the people. There is a bigger story than just getting through what you need to get through. There is a much bigger story than the multiplying of blessings in life. There is a much bigger story that actually is a sign of who God is to us. This story actually reveals something actually very profound that I think that, that we should really hold on to as a church. And so I'm going to give you a few things today that I think we need to know about this story and how it reveals and what it reveals and who Jesus Christ should be to us. So number one, I want you to write this down, that his work revealed his power. His work revealed his power. His power. you got to remember the context of what we're studying here through the year, that we're studying uh, the whole Bible together, and Jesus has finally arrived into the story. And what we see here is the power of God through Jesus Christ. Let's look at it again. His work revealed his power. Let's go back to John chapter number 6, verse 14. And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Here it is. They saw the power of God through Jesus Christ. They saw him take two fish and five loaves of bread and feed between 15 and 20,000 people. Y'all hear me? Some of y'all can't feed five people with two fish and five loaves of bread. See, here it is that, that he, he took little and did what? Made much. This, this reveals. Uh, his power. Actually, this is why they were following him in the first place. If you go back to John chapter number 6, verse number 2, let's go back to the top of this chapter. It says this, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Y'all see that? So, so, so here it is that they're following because they've seen his power revealed in the earth. He has just healed a few other people. And actually, in the Gospel of John, this is uh, Jesus' fourth miracle. This is his fourth sign to reveal who he is. And one of the things that I love about the Gospels is they, they, it reveals his power. Uh, one of the ways I say it is power must be exercised to be seen. That Jesus has to exercise his power for people to know that he's powerful. 
And through the scriptures, he actually does this. And this is what's so beautiful about this particular story in John. In all four of the Gospels, we find where Jesus feeds the 5,000. But unlike the other Gospels, John is the one that actually connects it to the feast of the Passover. I want you all to stay with me here. So if you go back to verse number four in chapter number six, if you have a Bible in front of you, I'm not going to put it on the screen, you'll see where it actually it notes that Jesus recognizes that it's right before the feast of the Passover. If you know that the feast of the Passover is actually a celebration for the children of Israel, for the Jews, where they remember when God delivered them out of bondage in Egypt. Y'all with me? And one of the great miracles that happened when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage through the wilderness, is that God provided manna from on high. Some of y'all saying, what in the world is manna? Manna is just bread. So literally, bread fell from heaven. You got to see this. So when these, these people that are following him, the crowds, the masses are following him, they are connecting what he provides in this moment based on what they know God did through Moses for the children of Israel. This is why when they see the power, they're saying, oh, he is the prophet that the Old Testament spoke of. Okay, okay, y'all still not with me? It's okay. See here, God's power, this is why we got to pursue to see God's power in Scripture. God's power reveals what's possible. Okay, I know. Now let me see if I can help you this way. You have to believe what's possible before you will trust what's promised. Write that down if you can. You have to believe what's possible before you trust what's promised. I'm telling you, I promise you that this particular miracle is not just so Jesus can make sure everybody doesn't go home hungry. He's actually trying to paint the picture of how powerful that he may be, that if he can handle this thing, that he can handle another thing. That if he can solve this problem, he can solve another problem. Before you can trust what I promise you, you got to believe what is possible for me to do. Here's what I'm saying. If you don't believe that God is all-powerful, if you don't believe all power is in his hands, you won't trust his promises that are outside your understanding of his power. You see what I'm saying? He's saying, listen, you, you got to make sure you understand his power. His power reveals what's possible. Power had been given to Jesus and as we as followers must walk in confidence in the revelation of the power of God. This is why I say all the time, I don't tell God how big my problems are. I tell my problems how big my God is. Y'all follow me? He had power over the circumstance and the illustration in the situation. Let me, let me see if I can help you uh, understand this a little bit better, more uh, applicable. Let me show you one of my favorite signs. Can I show you one of my favorite signs? Let's put that next sign up there. Let's put that next sign up there, Rob. You got it up there? Put that next sign up there. Anyway, they don't have it. There it is. Y'all see that sign? Y'all know what kind of sign that is? That's an elevator sign. It's one of my favorite signs. You know why? It tells me about capacity. We're not going to judge anybody in here. There have been some times where I've been on elevators, and I start counting people. Okay, I'm, I'm the only one. I, I'm, okay, thank you. Thank you. Here's what I'm saying. I start looking at the situation. I'm like, okay, okay, I'm doing the math here. 7,000 pounds. Mm, 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 mm. Now, in a situation where it's just a few people, I'm not concerned. You know why? Because I see the power that's in this elevator. It can handle the weight. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I, I can trust that the elevator is going to keep me safe. Why? Because I have a sign. And this sign informs me of the capacity of what I'm trusting my life in. So, so in the same way that if we come to God, and we don't know what he can handle. We won't trust him with our life. See, this is what I, I wish, TK, I wish more things told me its capacity. 
I, I, wish, I wish I knew when I got into a relationship with somebody that I knew that the capacity they could handle. I, I, I wish I knew that, that, that before I got my degree, that that degree wouldn't, wouldn't satisfy me. That, that it couldn't handle the weight of my life. It's a good thing, but it's not a God thing. I, I wish I knew before I got into the marriage that that person would never be able to fulfill me because that's not the purpose of marriage in the first place. Because it can't handle my capacity. It can't handle the weight of what I need. And what Jesus is showing us here in the text is that, listen, that everything else in life you think may be enough to sustain you. But until you understand the power that God has, you won't trust your life with that thing. And the problem many of us have is that we have put our trust in other things that we thought could handle our weight. And when it let us down, we thought it was God's fault. God said, no. I showed you a sign to show you and tell you how great and powerful I am, but you wouldn't trust me. He, 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 he's trying to reveal his, his, his power. Matthew chapter number 9, verse 5 through 6 says this, For which is easier to say, listen to this, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk. Mm -hmm. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Man, I, I missed this so many times when I read this story. And that I thought that Jesus was most concerned about making sure the man would rise and go home. No, what he was most concerned about is making sure you understood that he had the authority and the power to forgive sins. Here's what I'm saying. That if he can ask somebody and tell somebody to rise, get up and walk and go home, he has the power to forgive your sins. I don't know about you, but the power that I'm most concerned about is not whether or not Jesus can take two fish and five barley loaves and feed 20,000 people. What I want to know is can he forgive me of my sins? Can he deliver me from the spiritual bondage that I may be in? Can he heal not just my physical body? Can he heal my spiritual brokenness in my heart? And if he has enough power to do that, he can handle my sins. He says, which is easier, to tell the man to get up and walk or to forgive him of his sins? To prove to you that I can do both, I will tell him to get up and walk. To prove that he's forgiven of his sins. Because he's trying to display his power. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't, if you don't believe in his power, you won't trust his promise. This is hard. It was hard for me to grasp because I was like, God, I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. And God said, no, you don't. God, I, I, Lord, you are great and mighty. Well, Ryan, why are you trying to do everything on your own? God, there is nobody else like you. You sit high and you look low. You're all powerful. But Ryan, why? Are you trying to handle your life situations in your own power, strength, and experience? Why can't you put it in my hands? And when I came down to it, was, I didn't believe he was all powerful. See, God is trying to reveal his, his, his power. Let's keep moving. Number two, his work reveals his purpose. His work reveals his purpose. So number one, his work reveals his power. What he did on the earth reveals his power. But number two, it's right here in the text, it reveals his purpose. Everybody say purpose. Here it is, his work always reveals his greater purpose. Hear what I'm saying. The purpose of a sign was not to warn attention just to the sign, but to give attention to something greater. See if I can make this more plain. Now, I think one of the things that I've struggled with in my own life is that I have been a sign worshiper. I, 
I've been a sign worshiper. Ah. I've been a worshiper of the sign that actually indicates and communicates and points to something greater. That's like me saying, hey, I love the free Wi-Fi sign, but I've never signed on to the free Wi-Fi. We're going to see it here in just a minute. Oh, my gosh, I don't know if I have the time. It's okay. The sign is always supposed to point to something greater than what we are seeing right now. It's just a sign. North Carolina is not valued by the sign that we have when people drive into North Carolina. It's an indicator and a marker of where you are, but it doesn't define it. Okay, let me see if I can say it another way. God sent Jesus to point back to him with the signs that he performed. It communicates information. The signs that he performed communicates his love towards us. It also gives us direction. It tells us where and when and who we should be looking towards. But it also warns us. Because every good sign warns. Let me see if I can say it another way. Here it is. John 6, 14. Let's go back to our main text. It says, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. This is the proper response to the miracles, the signs, and wonders of God. That it should create belief in who he is, not just excitement about what he did. When God performs signs in your life, you shouldn't just say, I'm so glad, man, that I finally got what I've been praying for. No, you should say, God is a great and mighty God. He is the creators of the heavens and the earth. What's your response to the sign of who God is? The sign always revealed who he was. As I told you before, the feast of the Passover that's recognized here in verse number four is actually pointing back to the children of Israel when God delivers the children of Israel of, uh, with Moses out of Egypt. What John here is writing and what he's trying to communicate is that Jesus is the greater Moses. You got to see that. That Jesus is the greater Moses. What he's saying is, listen, while Moses delivered you from physical bondage, and while you all believe that it was Moses that prov provided for you physical bread from heaven, no, Jesus is here. He's the greater Moses. He has come to deliver you from spiritual bondage, and he didn't just come to, to offer you physical bread, but he says, I've come to be the bread of life. I want you to see that this is actually what uh, Moses prophesied. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter number 18, verse 15. I want to make sure you understand this is rooted in Scripture. Verse 15 says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is him you shall listen to. So when we see this in Deuteronomy, it's actually mentioned again in Isaiah, where Old Testament is actually pointing to Jesus. It said, This will be much like Moses. This will be another prophet like myself. And so when they see this, this miracle, it wasn't the miracle of healing that helped them know who he was. It was that he identified his miracle with providing bread for the children, for the followers, just like Moses did for the children of Israel. They put the two and two together and said, this must be he who Moses was talking about in Deuteronomy. Here's the problem. I want you to see this. Here's the problem. They misappropriated what he was supposed to do. They, they repurposed his purpose. It's right here in verse 15. Go to verse 15. Perceiving then, watch this, that they were about to come and take him by force. Watch this, to make him king. Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Okay, I want y'all to see what happened here. So Jesus goes up on the mountaintop. He teaches he feeds 15 to 20,000 people. They say, oh, wow, he must be the one, the Messiah that they prophesied about in the Old Testament. We're going to take him and make him the king. They missed it. They missed it. And Jesus says, no, that's not what I'm here for. I'm not here to be your political king. I'm not another Moses. I'm the greater Moses. Moses uh, delivered you from bondage, political slavery at that particular time. 
and what the people, the thousands of people that were following what they wanted, they wanted a Messiah that would free them from Roman oversight and Roman leadership. Said, Listen, I don't want to be your earthly king. I'm here to be the king that frees all mankind, Jew and Gentile. So the Bible says that they sent Jesus running up into the mountain. I love this because you got, you got to understand, let's be honest, y'all, if it were me and I just fed 15 to 20,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread and they tell me they want to make me the king, well, 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 all right. where, where are we going? Is it just me? My wife get to go too? Cool, we'll bet. Let's, let's go. They were going to force him to be king. But Jesus says, no, that's not my responsibility. That's not my goal. My goal is not to meet your earthly physical needs. That's not my primary goal. How do we know this? That Jesus avoided this temptation before. Where did he avoid this temptation? When he was where? In the desert, in the wilderness. Satan came and tried to tempt him with authority over kingdoms. Y'all don't, don't read the Bible? He, he came and tried to tempt him. And God says, no, Jesus says, no, that's not my goal. God is the only one that should be worshipped. And so twice now we see where Jesus is tempted with earthly kingdoms and earthly worship for the wrong reason. Because his purpose was much bigger than just meeting your needs. You got to see this in the text. Just like us at times, though, we try to repurpose Jesus in our life. I'm not even mad at them. Because if I saw Jesus feed 20,000 people, I'd be like, well, Lord, what you want to do? I, I want to put you into office. I, wanna, I want you to run for president. How can we get this guy into office? Because he knows the people. He sees the people's needs. That's who we would want. Because well, that's selfish. I don't know about y'all, but I can be honest. I can say sometimes in my life, I've selfishly tried to place Jesus on certain thrones in my heart because I want him to be the king of some things, but not everything. Oh, okay, okay. They wanted him to be a political king when he was called to be a spiritual one. Oftentimes, they want him to deliver them from what they wanted deliverance from, not what they needed deliverance from. We want him to be the king of certain things. I want him to be the king of finding me a job. Now, Lord, can you be my, my representative and help me find a job? Lord, you're the king of kings, the Lord of lords. All the good and perfect gifts come from you. you. You can do it. But we don't want him to be the king of our, our soul. Mm -hmm. uh, we want him to be the king of finding us a spouse. We want him to be the king of teaching us how to serve in our marriage. We, we want him to be the king of our health. God, you can, you can heal my body, but is he the king of your soul? Does he sit on the throne of your, of your schedule? Does he sit on the throne of your finances? Does he sit on the throne of your forgiveness? God, I want you to deliver me from this illness, but I don't want you to deliver me from this bad attitude. I didn't come to be your king for what you wanted me to be king of. I told you in the very first sermon in this sermon series that he is not just the Jesus that you want him to be. Okay, okay. They repurposed his purpose and Jesus fled the scene. So he's concerned. His concern and purpose has not just been our needs, but primarily has been our hearts. I love what Mark's gospel says. Right here in Mark's gospel of the same story, chapter number 6, verse 34, it says this. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Right before he feeds the 20,000, his number one concern was not if they were hungry. His concern was that they were lost. concerned about you? You're coming to him every morning, lifting up different things. He's, he's not worried. He can handle all those. Those things are minor. What he is concerned about is the condition 
of your heart. Here's what's crazy. Jesus actually calls them out on this. Let's keep reading. Verse 25 to 27. I love this. Because after this miracle, we see in verse 16 that later on that Jesus walks on water. Then he goes across the Sea of Galilee. And the people are looking for him. Jesus, where did you go? We're trying to make you king. And they finally found, find him in verse 25. Here it is. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. He says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you for on him God the Father has set the seal. Here it is. He's saying, the only reason why you came looking for me is because you ate your fill of the earthly bread. You didn't really see who I was. Here it is. He said, you missed the sign. You, you came to me looking for more bread, but you didn't realize that I am the bread of life. What have we chased God down for because we missed the sign? He says, listen, this is what hurt my heart. I was like, God, forgive me. Because there are several times I've come to God laying things on the altar, petitioning God for things. And all I was asking for were things that would perish. He says, you're looking for something from me that's not going to sustain you. Y'all don't believe me? Okay. <laughs> he says it right there. Truly I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. What are you working for? Are you pursuing God trying to get things that's just going to perish? Are you pursuing God trying to get things that won't last? Are you pursuing God trying to get things that are not going to sustain you? You see, because a sign was designed to point you past something that would perish, but past to something that would sustain you for eternal life. And they missed this. Which actually reveals the next point here, that his, his work reveals his plan. His work reveals his plan. The sign reveals the plan and the purpose. Okay, let's read it. Let's read it right here. John 6, 28 through 29. Then they said to him, what must we do? Great question. To be doing the good works of God. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you may believe in him who he has sent. Here it is, right there. All four, verse 13 verses of chapter number 6 were primarily to get to this verse. That you may believe in him who sent you. Sent him. That's all it's about. He says, I gave this sign that you might believe. I gave this sign that you might believe. Many of us are asking signs so we can be happy. Many of us are asking for signs that, that God would get us what we want. Many of us are trying to manipulate scripture. I've seen it all my life, trying to manipulate scripture to work on our behalf. No, Jesus says the primary goal of my work in the earth, the primary goal of these signs, while all these other things are good, it's your belief. So if these signs don't translate into belief, what's the purpose of the sign? Because we don't worship signs. His work reveals more than what he can do for us, but who he is called to be to us. So here it is. I want you to write this down if you can. That miracles are not the reward of belief. Here it is, but the root of belief. I, I want you to see this. And a lot of times that people think that, man, I I I'm getting rewarded with miracles. No, miracles are for signs. They, they, are, they are pointing to God's power. They're pointing to God's greatness. They're pointing to God's sovereignty. They're pointing to God's love for us. And when we see God's sovereignty, when we see God's grace, when we see God's mercy, it should birth belief in us. Miracles are not the reward. 
at the root. The sign is the beginning. The reward of belief, here it is, is relationship. That's it. The reward of belief is eternal relationship with the Father. John chapter 6 verse 4 is right here. For this is the will of my Father. He's still having the same conversation with the same people. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up in the last day. That's it. This has nothing to do with the car you're going to drive and how and what you're going to live in and how much influence you're going to have. No, the sign was to point you to belief, and the belief should turn for us for reconciliation with God through eternity. Here's the problem. For most of us, that's not enough. What about now, God? Is relationship not enough for you? Is the relationship with the creators of the heavens and the earth not enough? Is his presence not enough? Is his grace not enough? He's trying to tell them, y'all are missing it. Y'all are looking for earthly bread. I am the bread of life. Don't miss the sign. Don't miss the sign. Let's keep reading. John chapter 6, verse 47 through 41. He deals with this all over again. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Here it is. Why? Because I am the bread of life. Watch this. He said, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. Y'all missed it. He, he said, listen, Moses... He prayed for bread from heaven. He ate that bread, and as much as y'all want to celebrate that, that bread didn't sustain him for eternal life. He still died and ate that bread. He said, no, but I'm trying to offer you something that's going to be greater than the sign. The sign is just a glimpse into who God is and his power and what God can do. It's only a glimpse into his incredible love. It's only a glimpse into his incredible grace. It's only a glimpse. See, especially for those of us that know people that are unbelievers, I'm praying that, God, we would see signs and wonders and miracles in our church, that we would see unbelievers, that we would lay our hands on the sick and they would be healed, and they wouldn't necessarily worship us. They wouldn't necessarily just come fill up the seats in this church, but know that they would believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins and God loves them right where they are, and he wants to see them be more than they are. He loves them because they saw the sign. It says right there, verse 50, watch this. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. We thought this was about 10,000 people. No, Jesus was trying to show us his eternal power, his eternal purpose, and his eternal plan. Y'all see this? Verse 51, it says this, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Man, I felt like running when I saw, I saw this. So they're thinking about bread falling from heaven like they did in Deuteronomy. No, Jesus says, just like that bread fell on the ground for the children of Israel, I am the bread now that comes from heaven. And the bread that sustained them, it didn't sustain them forever. They had to keep going out and collecting it. But if you have Jesus one time, the Bible says you shall not die. I'm reading scripture here. He's not talking about you shall not have a physical death. He's talking about you shall not have a spiritual death, which is actually separation from God. I'm so glad to know that I will never have eternal separation from God. That's the greatest death that you could have, to be eternally separated from God. And he says, if you take up this bread of life, you shall never die. He said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread I will give for the life of this world is my flesh. Y'all know when you take communion, that, that little wafer that has no taste or flavor, that's a representation of his body that was laid down as the bread of life, that you might have eternal reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ. I don't know about y'all, but that's good news for me because I don't deserve it. 
Jesus came to be the greater deliverer than Moses. He came. He performed miracles, signs, and wonders. This is what's great for me, that not only does his work reveal his power, his purpose, his plan, but it also reveals my place. What's my place? My place is in a constant need and in a constant place of surrender to who God is. Have you missed the sign? Have you missed the sign? Have you gotten more caught up in what Jesus can do than who he is? Have you gotten more caught up in the hand of God moving in your life versus knowing the heart and seeing the face of God? I'm believing for signs and wonders, but I'm believing in signs and wonders that we might believe. There is a world that does not know Jesus Christ. And let's be honest, they might not really believe there's a Jesus Christ based on how some Christians treat them. They may not know there is a Jesus Christ based on the lack of the gospel being shared in the world around us. But I'm believing for a sign, a sign that would produce belief. My faith in this area has grown just in this past week because I'm believing that God is going to use signs to bring people to him. I'm believing that God is going to use miracles to bring people to him. I believe that God is going to use wonders to bring people to him. The scripture says that after they saw the signs, then they believed in his name. I'm not praying God that he would give us signs to help me get the things that I need done, done in my life. I'm not asking God to give us signs to help us accomplish our goals and dreams and meet our metrics. I'm not asking God for signs to make up for lost time when I didn't do something I should have done. No, God, I want you to send signs, miracles, and wonders through Vertical Church that people may believe that Jesus Christ loves them, that Jesus Christ sees them, that Jesus Christ hears them them and that Jesus Christ wants to be in relationship with them. I'm crazy enough to believe that God can still do miracles in this time, in this area, through this church. See, this is what's interesting to me. I was praying about this. Even me saying that I can see the unbelief in some of your faces right now. That's part of the reason why God is going to do signs in vertical church. Because you don't believe. That's why you don't trust him with your real situations. You don't believe he's all powerful. You say it, but you don't believe it. Just this week, God tested me with this. Just this week, God tested me with the word that I was going to preach on miracle signs and wonders. Just this week, my wife was sick just this week. And the other night, she woke me up concerned about her illness, concerned about her, her blood pressure numbers. She came downstairs and said, man, I... I I don't feel well, nothing feels right, everything. And I said, okay, okay, Lord, I knew it. I was sleeping. I, when I woke up, I went right into prayer. Words were, and I started speaking healing and life over my wife. My exact words were, these are the numbers. Your blood pressure is going to come down 120 over 70. I'm not asking, I'm commanding. If signs and wonders don't happen for anybody else in this church, it's going to happen in my house. Why? Because I believe. Y'all, so we sat there. I said, babe, how you feel? My hands are tight. You know what I'm saying? My feet are tight. All right. I start praying for her hands and the feet. Scale of one to ten, where are you at? She said, around seven. 
All right, in the name of Jesus. I, it's going to happen. I know the authority that I have in Jesus Christ. He's in me. This is going to be a sign. This is what I pray for. It wasn't for my belief, but it was for hers. Because I wanted my wife to know that God still heard her prayers. I told her, you don't have to have faith tonight, baby. I got you. You don't have to believe it's going to happen. You just sit there and you wait on what God is going to do. I'll have all the faith. I'll have all the belief. I'll say all the words. You don't have to repeat after me. You don't have to lift your hands. Just receive. Now tell me, how you feel? Round around five. Okay. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I command, I don't ask. So how you feel now? My hands are still tight. Pray for both hands. My feet are still tight. Pray for both feet. Scale of one to ten, give it to me. Down to the three. What did I do? I pray for every finger, each one. You probably thought I was crazy. Pinky finger, ring finger, middle finger, that little finger, index finger. I pray for every last one of them individually. I said, God, I'm going to try, I'm going to believe your word. I said, I need her to have a sign that she might believe. Help her unbelief. Upstairs, what, go, go check the blood pressure. I need to know. I don't ever actually check the blood pressure. I actually hate the machine. It gets on my nerves. Go check it. I need you to know that God is bringing your blood pressure down right now. She didn't take the medication. Did you take the, nope, didn't take the medication. The next morning, what did you text me? She texts me, babe, hey, my blood pressure is 123 over 70. Y'all see, I told you you didn't believe. I'm, I'm not saying this. I'm not saying this to show anything that I've done. I'm trying to help your unbelief. I've watched this woman battle with this over and over and over. We've had called the emergency, uh, called the ambulance to our house several times. Had to go to the emergency room several times. Had to call her friends several times. I said, no, not tonight, God. I'm believing for signs and wonders. Because I know we need to believe. Some of y'all, I know some of y'all are weirded out by this, but, but I'm trying to tell you, look, look at me now. I'm trying to tell you that miracles are going to happen, not just in this building, but through this church. The lame will walk. The blind, y'all ain't y'all don't have faith yet. I know I, I'll have to have faith for you for a while, but I'm believing miracles, signs, and wonders that will happen through our church that people will believe that Jesus lives. There is a great amount of unbelief in the earth today, and it's the responsibility of the church to show the world that Jesus lives. Miracles, signs. Wonders, miracles, signs, wonders, miracles, signs, wonders, miracles, signs, and wonders, miracles, signs, and wonders. Here's why. So we can see believers, followers, and disciples. See, that's when y'all supposed to shout miracle signs and wonders. When you believe that miracle signs and wonders will lead to believers, followers, and disciples. I told you our mission and vision here at Vertical Church is to see a thousand people in discipleship relationships by 2030. I believe a part of that happening is that we will see miracles, signs, and wonders. Maybe none of y'all need miracles in your life and in your family. But I believe if you start inviting the sick to our church, if you start inviting the lame to our church, if you start inviting the broken to our church that the spirit of God will begin to move in a way that will make people believe that his son died for his, their sins is there anybody that wants to see miracles, signs and wonders miracles, signs and wonders miracles, signs and wonders miracles, signs and wonders